and we can give that object instance a title and um, a, a content, and then we can actually save it. And what you see here is that there's a SQL transaction. How many of you are familiar with the idea of SQL? Okay, how many of you are not familiar with databases? Okay. So the idea is that you have this database. Um, stereotypically, people draw a cylinder, and that's the database. So you've got your your database over here, and a database is composed of tables, it's kind of like a big Excel spreadsheet. That you've got. Um, you might you have the posts table here, and then you would have um, a row here, and so you would have post one, two, three, like that. And then, change this, and we'll do each one has the opportunity to have content, title, and author. And so then, the idea is that when we create this object, and then we assign it attributes, and then we do a save, we're actually saying, hey, we want you to put this post object, we want you to put it in here, and then if it's a new object, it's going to create a new ID down here, and then it's going to save those contents, and then you can go back and say, I want number four, or I want number two, and then I want you to retrieve that data. So just a, so I think earlier you had said about that post ID, like it looked like it was sort of like a, a string of letters and numbers and other things. Mm -hmm. Is so it's is it not necessarily like it's not like instance or item one, item two, item three, or is it each one is you has a unique identifier? Um, um, you mean like so? Like I think earlier you showed how when you put something in, like yeah, there's like a number sign and there's like a whole bunch of characters and you're like gibberish. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so is each, is each sort of item or object or element in that database is it sort of characterized by that string of stuff, or is it like you actually have item one, item two, item three, item four? Yes and no. So the reason why there was this gibberish was like a zero nine seven yeah, D, right? G. That was the ID for the actual the Ruby object. Mm -hmm. So when the operating system <coughs> interacts with this Ruby object, it's got all this weird crazy operating system stuff that says I need to have a memory allocation, I need to have a memory stack trace for this, I need to be able to figure out where it goes in the operating system. Oh, so that's different than I right. was so this is this is a Ruby Ruby thing. What we're seeing here is a, a Rails object has those properties, but you don't have to interact with them. But all you're interacting with is essentially these things. So it's there, but you don't have to interact. It's like when you get in your car and you drive, you put in your key, you turn on the car, you press the gas pedal, and you move forward. You don't have to worry about the, the gas tank pump, you don't have to worry about the internal combustion, you don't have to worry about the different thermodynamic cycles. You just know that you can keep a drive. So Rails is the term key drive. So, and then the other thing, how many of you have written SQL before? Okay, so you probably get the, the select star, the insert, the update. So you actually don't write SQL with Rails. You actually execute methods, which then dynamically generate SQL, which is then executed. <laughs> so, in a way that is relatively secure and efficient. Okay. So I'll have to say you are doing SQL, but yes. <laughs> so what's the version of Ruby that you write now? The latest. <laughs> Um, it was three four six, I believe. So one nine three half a little four three three four Um I think my I don't always update every time. 
Um, so when we're creating a Rails app and we're working with Rails, the question is why do post that save work? Well, the short answer is it's complex. The longer answer is let's create a Rails app and we'll explain why post that save works as we create the app. Um, and so some of you have installed Rails. Some of you sent me either like emails or tweets saying, you know, what do I need to do to install Rails? The answer is that it's actually kind of it's very specific to your machine. If you're on Windows, you got to do certain stuff for that. If it's on Mac, you got to do certain stuff. So we're not going to actually go through the install process. And the reason is because we think it's more valuable to cover the big picture of what Rails is, and then you can go to Stack Overflow or kind of walk through individual problems. So it's not that we don't want to help you, but there's just a lot of variety, so we're just going to focus on those. My yeah. machine. We also did uh, create kind of a, a high-level installation guide for your various operating systems. I also put together a virtual machine if you're running virtual box or anything, you just want to have a, a Linux instance with all the common tools installed. Um, you can do that too. And also, uh, one caveat is you probably, if you're thinking about doing it on Windows, you should probably just boot up a, a Linux virtual machine. Um, and the reason for that is since Ruby is less alluded to as a C based language, C sucks on Windows. Um, for various reasons I won't get into at this for the moment. So if you run Ruby on Rails and Windows environment, it's going to take all day to boot up things like this console that you're using. Um, it's just going to be slow and irritating and you're going to move eventually. So let's start with a, a virtual machine if you want to like so you can be happy. Much happier. Plus, we're fitted with all the cool kids that develop. Um, I did start out, I use Windows all throughout college, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is my machine, um, and I just want to give you kind of a, if you were going to set up, you should be able to do a, ver a Ruby, which is saying which execute the Ruby language, and then dash B, which is saying, what version am I running? So I'm running one, Ruby 193, patch level 194. So you should just get something back if everything is working. It'll be different, but it's fine. Um, there's something called gems. We've mentioned that a couple times. Uh, in Java, you have jars. Those are essentially independent libraries that you can bring into your code base. Um, and like with jQuery, you've got plugins that you can bring in. In Ruby, you've essentially got gems, and that's a self-contained package of source code that then you can use so that someone else has written great code, you can bring it in and use their code instead of having to write it all yourself. So the way that you manage gems, or every time you hear the word gem, uh, G-E-M, there's a guy at work who says gem. It's like a workout gym instead of the Ruby gem. It's confusing. Um, every time you hear the word gem, you should think that's a package of source code that someone else wrote, wrote that I can then pull in and use in my project. So you manage that through something called Ruby gems on the command line. It's gem. And so you should get something back for that. Um, and then I'm suggesting you use my sequel because. Database out there, so I've got it installed, and so it's working. So then I do a gem install Rails, which says I want to install the Rails source code on my computer so I can use it, and then I do a Rails new example dash d MySQL. Looks like a lot is going on there. Essentially, what you're doing is you're saying I want to use the Rails source code, and then new is the command to create a new Ruby on Rails application. It then asks you for the name. I chose to name my example block. It'll be consistent throughout all the slides. Um, and then dash D says, I want you to set up my connection parameters to my SQL by default. So after you do that, it's going to generate a bunch of files that I didn't put in here. Then you change to that directory because it's an actual folder that's created. 
Um, you set up the DB, and then you do a write to DB create. That creates a MySQL database. And this is the point at which you are kind of like developing Ruby on Rails, actually. Um, yeah. So that's how you, you create an app, and you're essentially, you're setting up this whole project, and you're saying, give me an application that is contextually, it's its own context. So it's like you buy a car, and you get in the car, and then the car can take you places. You've created an app, you can get in that app, and you can create your application. So we created the Ruby on Rails application, but now we had, when we were with Ruby, we created a Ruby class. And so really after trying to save instances of that post model or an object, because that's IRB, the, the session wasn't able to save it, but Rails was, we want to do that again and see what happens. And so to do that, we're going to do something else in Rails, and we're going to create a Rails equivalent of post.rb, which was a Ruby class. And so, I don't know if you guys, can you see this up here? So again, we do the Rails, and it's, once you see this, you should, you should think that Rails is actually like a command. Um, when I first started developing Rails, I thought, I don't want to do anything in the, in the terminal. Like, I can't, I can't see what I'm doing, I don't know what's happening. But the command line is actually really powerful. So Rails will do a lot of things for you automatically. So if you do Rails, generate, and then model, model is the way that you're actually creating the equivalent from like a post.rb. And so then you specify the class you want to create, and then the attributes. So title, double colon string, content, text, author, string. And so the idea is that you're actually defining the MySQL column and the MySQL data type. And so if we go over to our database, when we declare that, we're saying, I want you to create the post table, and then the title, I want to be a string. The content, I want to be text. And the author, I want to be string. And so you're essentially generating this templated model that's all ready to go so that your, your Rails environment has a Ruby class, but then it's also setting up your database. And so if we look at the files that are generated, um, you're creating a DB migrate. This is what actually changes the database. We'll get to it later. You're creating an app models post.rb, which looks a lot like the Ruby file that we created, the post.rb, and then there's some other stuff. So we created that model that has the those data, has those data types on there? Yes. That's just for the SQL side, for when it's actually created the database? Yes. Okay, because Ruby didn't care about some of that. Right. But we care because we're communicating with SQL. Or and SQL Ruby. cares about okay. data types. So I forgot that I know too. So again, Rails is a terminal command. Generate Rails has templated generators. We'll see them elsewhere. It's kind of the nice thing about Rails. You get to use someone else's code that was written for you, so you don't have to do everything manually. Um, and so the only yeah, the only thing is that in the arguments you've got your variable and then you've got your your data type, which is important because it's important to the database. Just kind of that's a dumb question. Probably a way to just point it out to a class file and have it just suck that in because if you want to suck that in and generate it, it seems kind of redundant. You have to say, well, look, here's some spelling out of data that's in a class. Can you just go look at the class? Um, there are ways to do it, um, but typically the Rails convention best practice is you start in the other direction. Okay. So you don't, I mean, there's ways to reverse engineer for the okay. database. Okay. Um, so we've looked at that little post class, but right now we're saying, okay, let's just start like we're going to start. We start with the database. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're starting with the right. 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 I realize that most business projects have legacy stuff that you're pulling in. So let's look at each of these files individually, and we'll just kind of walk down. So first we'll look at the DB 
migrate. There's a time and date stamp, and that's helpful for keeping track of what, column, what tables and columns are in your database. Um, so that if you have eight developers working on a project and you have different people changing different things in the database, sometimes your database will blow up unless you've all agreed on what your on what your database is supposed to look like. So that's why we have the time and date stamp. It just helps for communication. Um, so if we look at it here, it's an actual file and it's a .rb file. So it's Ruby code again. And so here you're sending a class. So you've created a Ruby class and you're actually doing something with the, the less than sign. That means that you're inheriting from another class. So create posts is inheriting from active record migration. You might be thinking, what the heck is active record migration? Like, did something come up and eat me for breakfast? Um, and it's actually the active record migration. Active record is the, uh, the connector to the database. And so because you're inheriting from that, then you get special privileges to connect to the database. Really simple. And then, so that's a Ruby class. And then within there, we've got a depth change. We've seen depth before. That's a method. And so change means that you're going to make a change or an adjustment to the database. So then in here, you've got create underscore table posts do team. Looks kind of, you know, yeah, you haven't seen that before. What that's doing is that it's, it's passing a Ruby block, and then you're able to use this variable t to specify different aspects of your table that you're creating. You're creating a, um, you're creating a column, a string column, and it's named title. You're creating a text column, and it's called content. You're creating a string column, and it's an author. So this is written in Ruby, but kind of how we say you don't have to write SQL. This is where the SQL is being generated for you. So because you have this code, it's very simple. You can look at this in three seconds and know exactly what's happening. And then Ruby will say, hey, okay, we agreed on a way of talking about SQL. I'm going to generate the SQL, and then I can run against the data. So what is the T stand for? The T Do T, and then you can do 
just be what's basically a for loop. So we created the migration. It was actually automatically created for us when we created our model because it assumed that we needed to have a table for our model. And so then we want to actually, so we've defined our table and now we want to create it. So we do a rate, db migrate. And so the idea is that you can see that it says migrating, it's creating the table, it took 0 0.009 seconds. And it says, hey, it worked. We created the table. Sometimes it blows up and it doesn't work. And then your database is still fine because it rolls back the changes. It's awesome. So the next thing that we're going to look at is the app models post.rb. And this is the thing that looked really similar to the Ruby class that we wrote in the very beginning. Um, and so where that file is located is that it's in the example blog in the app folder, in the models folder. And so this is where the file actually lives. And so it actually doesn't look all that different from what we saw before. It's got a Ruby class, and then it inherits from Active Record Base. We've seen Active Record Base before. Active Record, excuse me. And that's what connects us to our database. So this is what enables the post.save, because post is an instance of the post class which has special superpowers from Active Record, which then can connect to the database and save. Yep. So then the next three files, the test unit and the test fixtures, um, there's essentially, within Ruby on Rails, there's this huge emphasis on automated testing, so that I can run, run um, I can write a bunch of tests that will tell me if my app is broken, because I either added or removed code in some place. And so that's just code that's automatically generated. We won't cover that, so be aware of it, but don't worry about it. Does it automatically run those tests? Um, it automatically runs them. They're essentially, you can turn on or turn off, or select a different test automation framework based on some configurations. There's a bunch of different things that you can do. Um, you can select, selectively run tests automatically. You can set up things that run tests on files that have changed automatically. Um, I mean, there's a huge emphasis in the Ruby on Rails community on testing. Um, so there's probably, per volume of Rails code, there's probably more tests than any other programming language that's out there. Just because of the community. So kind of looking back, what did we actually do? It was like kind of a lot of spaghetti. We did a Rails new example blog, which created a Rails app. We then went into that application, which is its own context. We did a rate DD create, which connected to the database, or if it wasn't there, it created a database, because I've given it my username and password to MySQL. Um, we then generated a post class with some different attributes. We then ran the migration, which created the table. And then the Rails console is similar to the either the Pry or the IRB, the little interactive Ruby console that we were running in. And so essentially you can run your application via command line just to see if things work, if you can do stuff. So we want to make sure that our post class is available. It is, because we can see that it returns here. If it wasn't, it would blow up and say class not found. So then we create a post object, the, the little post here. We then give it a title. We then save it, um, and it saves to the database. So this is what we did kind of from start to finish a couple times before. But I just want to show kind of the big picture of what, what did we actually change in order to get there. So what else is in this app directory? So we already looked in the app folder, and we already looked in the DB folder. So let's look at a couple of these other components and kind of survey the situation. Um, you can do a lot of different things with these things, but we're just going to keep it really simple and give you the knowledge of what's out there so that you, either when you run into an issue or you want to leverage it, you know where to go. And you might be asking, well, why the heck do I need all this stuff? I just want to create and save classes. Well, you want to create and save classes, but you want to do more than that. You actually want to have a model and then you want to go through a couple 
of levels and you want to go all the way back to the browser so you can deploy it on a server and all your friends can look at your cool app. So that's why you need all this extra stuff. So Roman Rails is MVC inherently, right? Yes. yes. So in the app folder, you've got places where you store your JavaScript, your CSS, and your images. You've got your controllers which are classes, Ruby classes that respond to URLs. You've got mailers, Ruby can send email automatically, automatically for you. Um, you've got models, which we've already seen. And then you've got your views, which are kind of like your HTML files. So then we've got in your DB, you've got all these files. And the reason why you have them is that Rails assumes responsibility of the database. It doesn't think that you're going to manage it via another mechanism. It says, I'm the one who's going to manage your database because I know exactly what's going on with it. So you've got your migrate folder, which is where you have your migrations, which change your database from having a table to deleting a table to adding a column to not having a column. Your schema RB is an output of the current tables and columns and their data types in your database. So if you're like, oh, I wonder if that column's in my database, you can look there and you'll find out Seeds.rb is a place where you can store seed data so that when you're developing and you want like all 50 countries, <coughs> 50 states in the United States, you can put them there, load them, and you don't have to create them every time. So what else is in there? You've got your gem file and your gem file.log. As we mentioned before, <coughs> gems are Ruby libraries that are not a part of the standard Ruby library or Ruby language. Um, there's something called Bundler, which is kind of the accepted way of managing gems. About a year and a half ago, there wasn't a way, and it was kind of wild west, wasn't fun. Um, and so you list your gems in your gem files, um, and then you can type in bundle install, and it installs everything for you. So then... What if you have, a, I guess, more than one project? Does it just download all the bundles and you just use them off your core? Or? You can do either. Yeah. By default, it'll apply to all, but you can set up called gem sets. Is the term for that? If you want to learn more information, um, you can find gem sets in your projects. You can learn where to sound the gem. Yes. The better gem. Yes. And the thing, that, and going back to your question about application level gem stuff. Um, Actually, that gem file being application specific, it'll define what gems to load in for your app. But on your machine, you have Bundler that loads up every gem that's ever seen. So you have all those gems installed in the machine, and then your app loads the ones from the machine that's in use in that gem file. So then, because, so back here, we only define like a handful of gems. You're thinking like, Usually a lot of stuff comes in there. If you're right. There's actually a ton of stuff that's in there. Rails, as it's as a gem, you're requiring requiring Rails, but Rails actually has dependencies within it. So you've got the active record, which we've seen before, and then active record also has dependencies. So you've got dependencies on dependencies on dependencies, and you don't know if they clash, if they conflict. You're like, oh no, I don't want to do this manually. You don't. Um, the gem file that lock manages that, and that's what Bundler does. So this is the place where you can see everything that you're ever going to need. So the readme.rdoc is just a cool place where you can tell your friends about your cool projects so that they'll come and write code for you so you don't have to. Um, rdoc is just a markup language that you can use so that you don't have to write all that HTML, which is really finicky with the brackets and the braces. Um, there's an example. Um, so then you also have this rate file. A rate file loads and defines rate tasks. We saw that you could do a rake db create or a rake db migrate. Um, rake is not specific to Rails, but Rails has chosen to use it as its main kind of like task manager. Um, and so there's tasks that are specific to Rails and not anything else. And so in your rake file, you're going to see that it loads rake tasks from the Rails gem. Um, the 
cool thing about Braden is that it actually loads up the entire Rails environment before it executes. So you can have it execute app-specific logic without you having to do anything. So you can have to use the architecture that's in your Rails app in your rate tasks. And so that makes it quicker and easier to write code to do more things. Now, break, I mean, that's a plan to make, right? The old place to make it. I would not. For the Ruby world. I would actually yes. bring up, it literally is, stands for Ruby. Ruby, Ruby, Ruby. Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, I think one of the neat things about that, for other people too, is I mean, uh, it's become so good that people are actually using it in you know, different environments as they make. Yep. It's, it's literally a wrap around, around make. Because remember, Ruby is written in C. So it's really just an interface wrapper to speak between Ruby and, and Make. When do, when do you use, I mean, I know Make from the C, from the C days, but what's, <coughs> do you just quote compile this once and then you run it, or do you, you do you use Rake interactively on a daily basis, or? Um, I mean, you use Rake mostly for initial configuration of things. So anytime you're actually running, command with Rails. It's actually a wrapper in the alias for a rake command. Because um, the scripts, if you look at the Rails scripts, they're actually making calls to rake. Um, is that correct? I think that's correct. But um, yeah, it, it's just really... So I think of it as behind the scenes doing yeah, a lot of things. It's really doing a lot of the day-to-day okay. -day magical. <laughs> so the interesting thing about rake is because it loads up your Rails environment, you can have it execute logic that exists in the post class. So let's say you wanted to publish all of your blog entries and essentially take your current database, copy your database over to another database that is on, let's say, Rackspace or Amazon. You could have a rake task that would do that because any logic that's in your application, you can essentially execute an array task because your rake because Rake loads the Rails environment, is aware of all the classes, all the data, all the relationships, and then it can execute whatever you want for it. So the company I work at, we actually use Rake to like import um, data sources. So we'll run Rake um, data source import, and it will make a call to an API, and then it will get the data back from the API, and then it will load it into our database. So you can use it for a lot of different things. Okay, so then you've got the config folder. Essentially, there's all these little nasty configuration files that come back to bite you in the bud. Um, yeah. So like your SMTP settings for connecting to an email server, or your, if you want to ensure that you're using HTTPS and all the links for your application, that would be set in your environment. So there's all these like little nitty gritty like ways that you can tweak your application. Those are gonna be in here. The important ones to know are your database.yml, which is where you define your connection parameters, your MySQL, and your routes.rb. We'll get to routes.rb later. Any other configs to mention? I, I, I would just, a recent event for this example, you mentioned that config files can get you in trouble. Um, if you're ever putting a, a Ruby on Rails application on say, GitHub, um, there's a file in that config that actually contains your secret token. And there's actually a recent flight of uh, Rails apps that have gone out there with their secret token on GitHub. And that basically gives you complete access to being able to impersonate any of the users in their database. Um, so just be mindful of where you put your configuration, if it's more in the machine or if it's out in public view. Right. Some of the configuration files in your, either in your initializers, folder or just in the config folder, you don't want to save because they might be your S3 connection parameters for your Amazon um, storage account or it might be for your, your credit card transaction account. So some of those you don't version control because then those pass username and password is going to be in there. Any developer can go in the source code, find it, and use it. So don't want to source control everything in there. So you're essentially saying you can open yourself up for identity theft <laughs> right. Be mindful of what you're putting on. Fair enough. If you're putting
putting a password that you don't want someone to have on GitHub, or you're putting a, a secret key or something on there, and then just alert to that. So then here you've got your database map line all file. Um, you've essentially got different connection parameters. Um, we can take a lot of time going over those, just know that they're there. Um, and then routes.rb, this is essentially where you assign specific URLs to connect to specific Ruby on Rails code. Um, there's also a docs folder if you want to write documentation. <coughs> Um, you've got your lib folder. Um, there's a folder called assets. Has anybody ever used this? I've never used it. Uh, lib assets. Uh, lib assets is for things like if you're using. Um, there's a model that exists that if your controller or your model gets really really big, then you extract a lot of those utility methods and put them in lib assets. It's just a way that it's just a place to put that those utility functions. Um, most Ruby on Rails apps, you're safe to put things in your model for a long time, and then they can overflow into those assets. Do you know the difference between app assets and those? Um, app assets is for things like your CSS, your JavaScript, um, and those kind of things. Your images, uh, all those sort of static assets. Uh, there's also a tasks folder or file. You can write custom rate tasks. Um, okay, and then you've got log files that you're going to be able to access. So if you run a local server and you want to see what your server did and why something didn't work, that's where it exists. Um, you've got your public directory, directory folder. Um, so exam for example, if you want to put a file in there that's going to be available no matter what, you would put it in there. Um, and then you would, so if you created a file pub, public slash testing.html and then if you fire up your Rails server and then put in this URL, you would be able to get to that text file. <coughs> That's not common convention, it's just a, a quick and dirty trick if you need it. Um, good question. So sometimes if you have a controller or, or outside app, that would be conflicting with what's in the uh, public directory. Mm -hmm. Is there a precedent that's that's given or I'll I'll give this to people. So um, for example, up until Rails 4, if you did not delete that index.html file that Rails generates, it'll only show that index.html because index I mean anytime you go to a web server it's gonna look for index.html and since it exists, it won't even hit the index router. Um, so then you've got the, the script. Um, this is where kind of Rails has put all of its magic. Um, this is where it makes its um, command line um, tool. This is where this is where the command lines go to figure out what to do. Um, and then you've got your your test folder. Um, as we mentioned before, there's automated testing. There's something called test unit, which lives in test. Um, there's also five other ones that also are out there. Um, we're not going to cover testing. Um, you've got a temp folder, which sometimes is used for uploading. And you've got a vendor folder, and this is where, so instead of doing a gem set, um, someone had asked the question, well, if you do a bundle install, where do your gems get installed? They'll be installed in, by default in the global gem set, or you can also say bundle install package, Bundle install, bundle package, echo. Um, that's for that get ignored. But you can package, you can send all of your gems into a vendor cache file so that you cache or kept the binary copies of all your um, dependent libraries. Not super important, just know that they exist. All right, so in review, cover the ligram. This is kind of the cheat sheet at the end of the run through. Um, on slide 30. So that is the basic outline of Rails. The next um, set of slides kind of gets into controllers and views, but that's the basic run through. So, any questions? This, um, this whole idea of, of generators. Kind of 
right here. I think you can know, argue about this in fact it's convention over right now. In other words, you, you, you guys are you, you guys have worked with this a lot, so you expect to see these folder layouts. You expect to find in every project you're on, you expect to kind of have a similar layout. Yep. I can go into any Ruby on Rails project and I know exactly not the bolts, how that thing works, just by looking at so the first thing I'll probably do is hit the routes folder just to understand the routes are good. I should look at you know, what are all the resources. When I hit the root domain, where is it pointing to? What view is it looking at? And I just have a really good understanding of how it works because of following those conventions. One thing that we did not mention that we should have mentioned is that Rails uses an MVC architecture. And so that stands for model, view, and controller. So you've got these things called controllers, you've got models, and you've got views, and there's a specific flow of information back and forth between your database and your browser. And there's different roles that it plays. It's kind of like one's a main character, one's a supporting actor, and one's the evil villain. And you can kind of always know who's going to play what role and what's going to happen in the storyline. And it's still an interesting plot. There's still Lots of code that you have to write in order to make the different characters do the different things. But you know the evil villain is always going to try and take over the world, and you know that the supporting actor is always going to be the person that dies, and the main character is going to be the person who is, you know, either sadly or happily ever after. So the model view controller setup gives you um, assumptions and conventions that you follow specific to the MPC architecture. Lunch will be here in 15 minutes or so. Um, if you're super hungry, I think there's more food. <laughs> Otherwise,